All right, we are live. Thank you for joining us today. We are going to be taking a look at what we're calling the Muhammad you never knew, the Sira material, i.e. the biographies of Muhammad, present a lot of material that Muslims find very embarrassing, so they never talk about it. Uh, maybe they've never read it, but they certainly have absorbed it from, uh, you know, from mosque and, and school and whatnot. They absorb the general ideas, even if they never read the actual biographies. So then we have particular details that they would find quite embarrassing, and that's what we're going to be taking a look at today. Let me just lead us in a quick word of prayer before we get started. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time together. We thank you for the technology that allows us to connect with fellow believers around the world, and as well as non-believers. We ask that any Muslims listening today approach the material with an open mind, that they not just simply say, you're lying, but rather ask themselves why they've never heard this material before, because we certainly aren't making it up. We ask that you be with us and you guide us our discussion today, and we ask that anything that we say that is untrue is simply forgotten, and anything that we say that is true and useful is remembered and applied to people's lives. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so I didn't say yet, but I am joined once again by Lloyd and Io from the Third Apology. I'll give them a chance to say a couple words of introduction here in a second. I just wanted to point out that in the thumbnail, you'll see a picture of Muhammad. Now, you might look at the thumbnail and you'll be like, what are you talking about? I don't see any picture of Muhammad. Well, well you'll see what I mean as we go along. Uh, Lloyd, anything you'd like to say? Um, on the topic, no, I'll, I'll jump into it and, and discuss it as we, as we go. Ayo, anything you'd like to say? No, just thank you again for letting me be here. And uh, yeah, I think it's going to be a good learning experience, both for Muslims who've never heard it, as well as uh, most Christians. And so, yeah, as you said in the prayer, I, I just pray that they all view with an open mind and that they um, consider what uh, Lloyd presents and our, and our uh, thoughts in response as well. All right, so without further ado, we'll go ahead and dive in. Lloyd is going to be taking us through uh, various sources. Uh, what we'll find is that the Sira is not one source, but a hodgepodge of sources. So he's gonna be looking at the same kind of ideas in multiple different sources, then move on to another idea, looking at multiple sources. Hopefully it's pretty clear what he's talking about. But if you have any questions, just put them in the chat and we will be happy to address those. All right, yeah. So I'll start sharing. Okay, so hey everyone, um, thanks for joining us again. Thanks for all the, all the support. People, obviously, the Quran doesn't say very much about Muhammad. It speaks about only 25 prophets, I believe, at most, although it mentions there's something like 130,000 of them. And for some reason, though, it speaks about, sorry, there is the Sunnah, the way of Muhammad, which, and mostly Muslims refer to the Hadith. However, the Hadith are not the complete picture because they're not chronological. So if you want to understand Muhammad's life and the life of his companions chronologically, you have to go to what's called the Sira. The Sira are the biographies of Muhammad, also known as the prophetic biographies. Today, we're going to be examining multiple different biographies of Muhammad and learn about how Islam and how the major scholars of Islam who wrote these biographies deified Muhammad. They made him a god. They made him a partner of Allah. In fact, he is the King Messiah. He is the true Jesus. And Jesus of the Christian Bible came to foretell the coming of the King Messiah, Muhammad. Would you summarize, would you say that is an accurate statement, That is. Yep, I would say that is accurate. If they wanted to have a direct comparison with something in Christianity, although obviously there are certain, definitely some differences, but as far as the nature of the topic, the Sira is most equivalent to the Gospels. Yeah, so the Sira is very much like the Gospels. So I've entitled this uh, discussion today, Muhammad, the Seal of the Prophets, uh, because we're not allowed to um, 
use an image of Muhammad, so I decided not to do that. Uh, we're not allowed to use a picture of Muhammad, so out of respect to that prohibition from the Sharia, I decided to use something appropriate. Okay, so now, briefly then, what is the Sarah? Now, this is a comment that I found on a website. Sums it up really well. So the Sarah, they started writing them, and they're still writing them today. They're Sarah that are dated now, right? Written over 100 years after Muhammad, and they were abridged, they were censored, they were edited, and they were copied 250 years after Muhammad. So of what value are they if they're such late documents, right? And because... According to this author, and from what we know, the only useful history of Muhammad comes from outsiders who mention him briefly as a warlord who lived after his date of death. So it seems that the real Muhammad may have been a scandal to the Arabs. And it's very possible historically that he was assassinated by his companions. But we're not here to discuss that issue. Now, I'm going to be using various different Sarah. Um, of course, everyone knows about Ibn Isaq, Ibn Isham. So let's look at a statement from Islam QA. As for the statement of Abu Bakr mentioned in Ibn Ishaq, it should be reliable. Ibn Ishaq is regarded by Imam Shafi, who is the founder of the Shafi School of Jurisprudence, as well as Ahmad Ibn Hanbal and Bukhari, Muslim, and many others as a by and large reliable source, especially with regards to Sirah. And this is from Ilyas Patel on Islam QA. So I'm going with the biggest Islamic advice site in the world, which, as you know, gets roughly 400 million visits a month. Right. So we're going to be talking about a man called Muhammad Ibn Abdullah Ibn Abdul Muttalib Ibn Hashim Ibn Abman blah blah, blah 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 blah. And that is the entire name. This is Muhammad's name. The source here would be Muhammad, the last prophet, a model for all time. Now, Muhammad forms, in my view, a holy, an unholy trinity. You have Muhammad here, then you've got the Quran, and then you have Allah. Right. There is no Islam without Muhammad. There is no Allah without Muhammad. So Muhammad, in my, and this is the case I'm going to put forward and hopefully provide the evidence for, Muhammad is a divine part of the Trinity with Allah and the Quran. Now, as we know, Islam tells us Allah is no partner, except Muhammad is his partner. Only Allah is eternal, except the Quran is eternal. Only Allah is perfect, except the Quran is perfect and Muhammad is perfect. The word of Allah, the Kalam Allah, is not Allah. The word of Allah is eternal, and the word of Allah, as we know, is Jesus, because the word of Allah was breathed into Mary. And Allah, of course, is not like any other God. And in fact, he's not even like humans. He has two right hands. And in fact, Allah has two right sides, right? Muhammad, one of the narrators, said in his hadith, and both of his hands are right hands. That's Sunan an Nasai. Either side of the being is the right side, and that is in Sahih Muslim. So now you have a God who is, as I've said, um, deformed. Any comments from you guys? Any questions as we go? Because I want to introduce people to some of the crazy things that are written mm -hmm. that are supposedly um, Sahih. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean, go ahead, yeah. Uh, I was going to just say that, you know, the, the sources say that Allah is unlike anything else, and we kind of just grant to the Muslims that, you know, he's a spiritual being and kind of our conception of God. But if you really dig into the sources, it seems that he actually is a, some sort of physical being. Now he's unlike any other physical being. He has two right sides, however that works exactly. He has two right hands. But he definitely seems to be a physical being. Mm -hmm. So I'm yeah. to zoom in to make this larger, yep. Yeah? Oh yeah, that can help. Yeah, that's a great point, Thaddeus. I mean, I know that the point of this presentation is, is more specifically meant to focus on Muhammad and how he's essentially deified through the Sirah. But um, another kind of side issue that we can't pay attention to is definitely how it talks about Allah and uh, the different uh, attributes and characteristics that we see um, regarding him. So there are going to be multiple things that, um, you know, you want that the viewers are definitely going to want to make sure that they pay attention for and look out for, especially the Christians. Um, really challenge yourself and see if you can uh, notice any parallels, as Thaddeus hinted at the beginning, between what Lloyd discusses and what we may see in the Gospels or um, other parts of the Bible. Yeah, I just think we are made in the image of man. So the image of Allah is a little deformed. I mean, sorry, we are made in the image of God, right? But we're yeah. not in the physical image. We are made, I think, um, in the, what's it, the something day? What's the term that, that is often used to describe the made in the spirit oh. of God? Or, uh, yeah, Amagadeo. 
Imago yeah, Imago Dei, the image of God, yeah. But I just find, I mean, how do you have a being that is has two right sides? Right. So anyway, now Muhammad is the perfect man in Islam. He is the perfect example to follow, for all Muslims to follow. Of course, only Allah is perfect, but Muhammad is perfect. Of course, we also know, and I will get into this in detail, Muhammad had head lice living in his hair. We know this from the Sahih Hadith. And of course, we know that six-year-old Aisha scraped semen from Muhammad's clothes with her fingernails. I think I have about 27 hadith attesting to this. Wow. Right. Now, let's start with Aisha. So I'm going to be putting out a fair amount of information. I want to introduce you to a variety of sources and ideas that for some reason Muslims do not want to discuss. And if this stuff is sound, if it is sahih, if it is found in the Sharia, and for those who don't know, Islam is not just the Qur'an. Islam has many books. You have the, the Hadith, certainly. But you also have the Sirah, and we will be covering that today. But you also have all of the laws, all of the actions that have become the law of Allah and the law of Muhammad. And that's synonymous to Islam. Allah and Muhammad are the same when it comes to the laws. That's the Sharia, the law of Allah, right? The law of Muhammad, the perfect law that all Muslims want to impose and live under, supposedly. This is found in a series of books. These books, these form what's called the fiqh, which is the exegesis of the law. But you can read it. It's not a secret. They discuss it. They use the term sharia a lot. And you can read them. These are just books. That in, and we'll be discussing a little bit of that. Because these ideas that you'll find in the sirah have become part of the sharia, which is the permanent law of Islam. So Aisha said, it is you who pretend to be a prophet from Allah. And this is written by Al-Ghazali, who is the prime Muslim after Muhammad. He's considered the most important Muslim scholar in history after Muhammad. So she said, it is you who pretend to be a prophet from Allah. Now let's go on. Muhammad says, the superiority of Aisha over other women is like the superiority of Tarid to other meals. So apparently she is the most superior woman of all time. I would assume this is the word of Allah's messenger from Bukhari, right? Volume 5, Book 57, Hadith 14. So we also know that apparently Aisha was a great scholar. Now hold that thought. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Now, can we trust the basic facts that Islam gives us? For instance, we are told Muhammad married the 40-year-old Khadija, right? This is common knowledge. This is the basic narrative. Correct, guys? Yes. So the report of the marriage of the prophet to Khadija bin Khuwailid, while her age was 40, is from the weakest of narrations reported by al waqidi and it is matruk. Matruk means it is rejected in hadith. Now, this is from a book called Famous but Inauthentic Stories from the Sirah of the Prophet Muhammad. This discusses stories that are common in Islam, but are false because they've become common, but they have no evidence to back them up. Now, matruk rejected is essentially a, 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 a hadith that has been falsified, right? There is no evidence for it. It cannot be used. So in fact, it is weaker than a weak hadith. And Muslims are always telling us that's a weak hadith. Well, this is two grades weaker. Any comments from you guys? No, it's very interesting. I, I didn't even know it could... That, that you could go lower than that. And so, yeah, I, I had no it's, idea. It's volumes. So, rather, it is said by Imam Ibn Kathir that Khadija was 35 or she was 28 or she was 25. <laughs> so, she's definitely 40 years old or maybe 35 or maybe 28 or maybe 25. Her giving birth to six children strengthens the view that she was definitely younger than 40. So how does a 40-year-old woman give birth to six children in the 7th century? Medically, it's not even possible today. So, as I said, this is the book, and I'm happy to bring it up and show it if anyone wants to have a look. In fact, here it is. Summarizing what is commonly spread but not proven from the Sirah of Prophet Muhammad by Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdullah al-Ushan. We're going to find out in a moment in the comments that he's not a real Muslim. <laughs> Right. Now, oh, before, you, before you go on, I just wanted to say that, you know, we, we see this a lot and maybe not the age of Khadija, but 
we certainly see it in, in the comments all the time where Muslims are happy to repeat stories that are graded as fabricated. But then when we create something, quote something Sahih they don't like, they're like, oh, no, 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 you can't quote that Hadith. We don't believe in that Hadith. And it's just crazy that they'll, they'll accept anything they like, regardless of whether it has any credible authenticity or not, and reject anything they don't like, regardless of how authentic it supposedly is. Right. Correct. They, they will throw any scholar, any famous scholar of Islam, anyone under the bus. As someone told me yesterday, you keep quoting these 13th century books. Well, those are the basis of Islam. Right, from your top scholars. So now Hafiz ibn Kathir said that the other point of view sayings are incorrect and prove that Khadija was only 25 years old at the time of marriage of Prophet Muhammad. I'm not going to belabor this point. However, there are multiple different articles and her age when she married, <laughs> notice here they say anything from 25 to 46. Her age has been pegged at 25, 28, 30, 35, 44, 45, or even 46. <laughs> right, now this is now... Yes, I was, I was just gonna say they, they know that she was definitely alive. <laughs> That's about the extent of, it, of what they could say for sure, right? Oh yeah, but if you, yeah, but when you go through the sources in the book, the book, the, this one I just showed you a little moment ago, it states that this is the evidence for it. This is the chain of narrations. And this is why it is false, right? They don't want to call it a lie. They don't want to call it false. They say unauthentic. Right. They want to use a euphemism. And I found multiple, multiple articles online about this, which all state, look, we don't know. So let's have a look at the Sharia. Now, this is from the Umdat al-Salik, which um, is the most authentic, the most authenticated, the most endorsed, the most famous, the most used, the most read, the most sold, the most referenced Sharia manual in the world. Wow. Right. So this is the most famous, there is nothing more famous than this. And the Sharia is the final word of Islam. It says, the Prophet said in a section called Enormities, which is P9.2, a lie about me is not the same as a lie about someone else. Whoever lies about me shall take a place for himself in hell. Now, this comes from Bukhari. And I have found multiple. I've only quoted two here. There are multiple. I think there's about 13 of them. Nine. Nine hadith in Bukhari alone that say that anyone who lies about Muhammad will go to hell. Based on this, now I will start tying all of the things I've been saying together. Based on this, we will discover that a fair majority, including Aisha, Muhammad's wife, his favorite wife, including the major scholars of Islam, even his companions, are all bound for hell because apparently they're all lying about Muhammad. Wow. And so let's go on. Narrated Ibn Umar. So I want to bring another point into this discussion. When the Muslims arrived at Medina, they used to assemble for the prayer and used to guess the time. So during those days, the practice of Adhan for the, for the prayers had not been introduced yet. So obviously Islam went through a period of development, right? And refinement. It wasn't revealed all at once, which also tells us that Obviously, this information is not in the Quran. The Quran's incomplete. It had to be developed. It made its way into the narrations, into the, the stories, the traditions, which eventually made its way into the Sharia manuals, right? Where it became fixed orthodoxy. So they discussed the problem regarding the call for Salat. Some people suggested the use of a bell like the Christians. Others proposed a trumpet like the Jews. Umar was the first to suggest that a man should call the people for Salat. So they ordered Bilal and he became the first man to announce the prayer in Islam. Bilal, his Jewish name, his Hebrew name is Belial. And this is a term occurring in the Hebrew Bible, which later became personified as the devil in Jewish and Christian texts. Alternate spellings include Balial, Balial, Belhol, blah, blah, blah. Very interesting. So theologically, what are your thoughts on that? So you can already see the connection because, I mean, as, as you'll even show, I don't want to jump the gun too much, but you mentioned too how the name Allah in Hebrew is, is, is the word for curse. And you kind of see these, these, uh, these uh, almost, almost kind of yeah. negative parallels between one ideology and another. So right here we are. Yeah, there you go. And so we see Baal in the Bible and, you know, how he's, you know, this, this, this pagan God that the Jews are constantly going to when they, when they leave the Lord. We see that as well within Islam, except obviously he's portrayed in a more positive light. We see how Allah is the Arabic name for God in Islam, and he's, you know, he's, he's God. He's the one above all. And yet in Hebrew, that name means nothing but a curse. And so 
we're going to see more of these parallels as we continue, but yeah, I, I think that life really is poetic in a kind of funny way there where you can see those just direct opposites between two different worldviews. Right. So now let's talk about Muhammad. So keep all these thoughts together, hold them in mind as we go uh, forward. Before, so, you, before yeah. you go on, we have a question. Uh, sure. DHC21 asks, who determines whether something about Muhammad is a lie or not? That is a good question. That's the scholars. That's the scholars that the Muslims in the YouTube comment section deny. So the major source of authenticity, the major source of authority is what's called the ijma, the Islamic consensus, the scholarly consensus or the scholarly agreement, right? So you've got your major scholars that belong to the four schools, which people have flat out denied to me in the past in the YouTube comments. And their agreement of what the Quran means of what these stories mean and how to do the exegesis of these stories and events. This has become Islam. This has become the Sharia, which has created the fiqh. So you've got all of these things that Allah prohibited and didn't, pro didn't allow and so on, the, and did allow, that became the Sharia, the laws. And, and then from there, how do you apply it? The Sharia is the application of that. And the fiqh is like the detail, the specific detail, the legal text. So this is entirely on the scholars. That is your that's your major source of of um, of Islam of Islamic authority. Right to go on. So let's look at something from Tirmidhi, graded Sahih. O Messenger of Allah, when was the prophethood established for you? And Muhammad said, "Well, Adam was between being soul and body." In other words, Muhammad Allah made Muhammad a prophet before Adam was born. So Muhammad's future was ordained right now when you start to go into the text because i'm not going to go into any one text i've got about three dozen different texts that i'm referencing today they state that allah defined muhammad as the coming messiah while you know long before adam right so they take this literally this is this hadith is actually taken literally right so now i thought adam was the first muslim but apparently muhammad was muslim before adam so Anyway, so let's have a look at some of the contradictions, right? Muhammad, as you know, is the same as all the prophets because it says in the Quran in 2.285, we make no distinction between any of his messengers. And we say, hear and obey. And hopefully Didat's listening because it says we make no distinction between any of his messengers, right? Each one believe in Allah and his angels and his scriptures and messengers. But of course, Muhammad is nothing special. And Muhammad is also unsure of his own salvation. I am not something original among the messengers, nor do I know what will be done with me or with you. I only follow what is revealed to me, and I am not but a clear warner. And that is Quran 46, 9. I am no new thing among the messengers of Allah, nor know I what will be done with me or with you. So what's the theological implication of that, guys? So ba basically, I mean, you, you see how on one hand, He's saying that, you know, he's, I, I almost want to say, use, use the word preeminent, you know, placing himself before Adam, placing himself before any other prophets throughout history. And then yet when the rubber meets the road and he's asked about these things concerning salvation in the future, I mean, he's already not giving any clear prophecies or miracles, but he doesn't even know his own fate. And so you have a kind of contradiction going on because on one hand, Muhammad is basically portrayed as this one who has been set in stone from the beginning. And yet when we see him in his interactions and in his sayings, he's, I mean, he's, he's no more than just a regular man, which is what we'd expect. So you can right. see how the sources really do elevate him and put him on this pedestal that he never himself, yeah. you know, really pushed. So we'll get to that. Exactly. We'll start to show how this story changes. Um, Ed yeah. Watt said number 14, the antique world meant old, perfect, mature. So Alibaba had 40 thieves. Muhammad received revelations at age 40. <laughs> yeah, wow, there you go. Khadija was 40. That's where, no doubt, where the invented age comes from and why that one was picked. Brilliant. Well said. Yeah. So now, uh, be Muhammad before you go on, I wanted to say that, uh, you know, the, the Muhammad of the Quran is the, you know, the, this only a messenger figure, very much yep. so. And the only thing that Muslims take from that is that phrase. They, nothing else from the picture of Muhammad in the Quran. Do they take yeah. as being Muhammad? Everything else they tell us about him comes from the Hadith or the Sirah. 
And that Muhammad's quite different as we're about it's to totally see. Totally different, yeah. So understand, he doesn't know if he's going to paradise. I thought Muhammad came to bring salvation. But yeah. he personally doesn't know if even he's going. He doesn't know, right? He's unsure. So how can you be sure? So but let's have a look. So Muhammad is nothing special. He is unsure of his own salvation, except Muhammad is superior to all the prophets. Abu Huraira reported that the Messenger of Allah said, I've been given superiority over all the prophets. So he's nothing special, except he has superiority over all previous prophets. I've been given words which are concise but comprehensive. I've been helped by terror in the hearts of my enemies. Spoils of war have been made lawful to me because Islam's religion of peace. The earth has been made for me clean and a place of worship. I've been sent to all mankind and the line of prophets is closed with me. And of course, they then go on to say, in, in, that's, that's Muslim, that's Sahih Muslim. And in Bukhari, we have, I will be the chief of all the people on the day of resurrection. Wow. So this is a very long hadith. This is just a small section of it. Oh, Jesus, you're Allah's messenger and his word, which he sent to Mary and his superior soul. And you talk to the people while still young in the cradle. Please intercede for us with God. Don't you see in what state we are? And Jesus will say, my Lord is angry. Okay. And he'll say, go to someone else. Go to Muhammad. Jesus can't help the people. Wow. So they will come to me and say, oh, Muhammad, you are Allah's messenger, the last of the prophets. And Allah forgave your early and your late sins. Intercede for us with Allah. And the prophet will add, I will go to Allah's throne and I will fall in prostration. And Allah will guide me to such praise and glorification to him as he has never guided anybody else before me wow. right so, so basically it's basically that. jesus becomes nothing but this this uh i mean basically how, how the muslims portray him he, he's merely the one pointing to muhammad he's not muhammad. the end all be right. all like muhammad claims to be wow yeah so now we get into the interesting so only muhammad was sent to all mankind the prophet said i've been given five things which were not given to anyone else Mm -hmm. Allah made me victorious by terror, by frightening my enemies for a distance of one month's journey. The earth has been made for me and my followers, right? The booty, that's war booty, has been made lawful for me. It is not lawful for anyone else before me. I've been given the right of intercession on the day of resurrection. Now, if you go to Genesis 49, and we'll come to that, understand that Genesis 49 is a prophecy about Jesus who will receive the scepter of power. He will be the Shiloh, the Jewish word, the Shiloh. He will receive all power and authority at the end of days, and he will intercede for the souls of mankind. Muhammad is now usurping that right. Every prophet used to be sent to his nation, but only I have been sent to all mankind. That's Bukhari, volume 1, book 7, hadith 331. Uh, Except Muhammad one thing to point out with that, uh, where it said, made only for me and for my followers since and my followers is in parentheses that was probably added by the translator it probably actually <laughs> just says the earth was made for me that is true that is true because wow. it says in the original if you go to the sarah it says um the earth has been made for yeah the earth has been made for me and allah you know there's, there's that statement so yeah and except so muhammad was sent to everybody except muhammad was sent only to the arabs and those who disbelieved Say, why has a sign not been sent down to him from his Lord? You are only a warner. And for every people, there is a guide. So every people have their own guide. And the disbelievers say, why is not a sign sent down to him from his Lord? You're only a warner. And to every people, there's a guide. So I'm using two different Qurans, except when they translate it as Muhammad is being sent to everyone. And they say, thou art but truly a warner. And to every people, a guide. Think of the subtlety there. You are a guide to every people or to every group of people. There will be a guide sent. Yeah, this subtle interpretation by Yusuf Ali means that he's the guide to every people. Right. Interesting. So let's continue. Now, Muhammad's followers, as you know, will largely go to hell. So 72 out of every 73 Muslims is going to hell. The messenger of Allah said, what befell the children of Israel will befall my ummah. If there was one who had sex with his mother in the open, then there would be someone from my ummah who would do that. The children of Israel split into 72 sects, and my ummah will split into 73 sects. All of them are in the fire except one. And which is it, O Messenger of Allah? He said, what I am upon in my companions, that's Tirmidhi. And we can find this elsewhere as well. Now think about it. What he's saying is that 72, effectively, 72 out of every 73 Muslims is probably going to hell. Yell. Yeah. It sounds like he's trying to one-up the, the Jews here. 
and basically make a point how, you know, if, if they have 72 sex, I'll have 73 and I'll just throw away the 72 just so my group can go. It's insane. Yeah, but which one? Which one is the one that you're standing upon? That's true. Yeah, you don't even know. It's crazy. Okay. As you know, Strong's Dictionary in, in Hebrew, a law, a law, okay, you know that, means curse, right? So let's talk about now. So let's go into Muhammad's birth, right? So he was born on Monday, the 12th of blah, 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 in the year of the elephant. It was the most auspicious day in the history of mankind. Of course, others say it was the 20th. So that's apparently the 20th of April in 571. Oh, isn't that the wrong year? So he was born inside 570, except he was born in 571. Okay. And he was born on the 12th, which is the 20th of April. Mahmoud Bashar al Falki, a famous Arab Muslim astronomer of his era, proved after much research that the date of the birth of the Prophet was the 9th of Rabi. Okay. Not the 12th, the 9th. And then, of course, you have the scholars telling us what we are sure of is that the prophet was born in the year of the elephant only. As for the exact, and Sheikh Albani said, as for the exact date of the birth of the prophet, there are conflicting reports regarding the date and the month, which Ibn Kathir had mentioned in his book, and all are without a chain of narration, a weak hadith. My golly. Some said he was born on the 8th, some on the 12th, some on the 9th. So nobody knows. And the only and ultimately their, their final statement is, we, all we know is he was born in the year of the elephant, 570, except he may have been born in 571. Yeah. Huh. So good stuff. Good stuff. So we, yeah. So if, if Aisha says he pretended to be a prophet, if his wife wasn't 40, but was 25 or 26 or 27, maybe 28, possibly 29, possibly 30, how can, they can't even tell us the date of his birth. And again, this is from famous but unauthentic stories from the Sarah. But let's continue. Well, how can we be sure of anything? So Muhammad was born after the death of his father. Before his birth, Amina witnessed many an omen. Okay, that's from Ibn Isham, and they use it continuously, and Ibn Kathir. And we hear that only three persons in the entire history of Arabia had been called Muhammad. And their parents had heard from the Jews and Christians that a new prophet was to be born in the near future and his name would be Muhammad. And Muslims do this constantly, right? Your thoughts on that? Because they constantly claim, and we'll show that, they're always talking about Jews and Christians knew about Muhammad from the Bible. And yet there were very few people actually named Muhammad during that time. I mean, during the pre-Islamic period. Yeah. So. You know, they're making that claim in isolation, but if we were to just look at the demographics of that time and the, I don't know if you say census data, but you know, the, the data from that time, they had every reason to assume that it wouldn't, that he wouldn't be named Muhammad. They had every reason to never be expecting him. And yet they want to affirm the exact opposite with no warranted proof whatsoever outside of verses which say that he is in there, but it's just circular reasoning. Why are no Christians and Jews called Muhammad? I don't, I don't from know. So now let's talk about, so Muhammad was a shepherd boy whose heart was removed. Two angels seized the apostle of God. They opened up his belly and extracted a black drop from it. They then thoroughly cleaned his heart and healed the wound after putting the heart back in its place. Right? And from a different, this is from Ibn Isham, right? Ibn Isak, the Sirat Razulallah, right? Then, of course, we have angels appeared and opened the heart of the prophet to fill in his heart with faith and wisdom. And of course, the scholar Maliki, um, Anas B. Malik, says this incident pertains to a state in between the world of similitude and sensorial world. Where in that state, there would neither be any harm done by the opening of Muhammad's belly, nor any visible effect of it would remain there. Except in a different narration, there's a scar of the operation witnessed by his friend. Wow. So now Muhammad said, the Prophet of Allah said, my heart was removed and washed with Zamzam water, then returned to its place. I was filled with faith and wisdom. And that's Tirmidhi, right? And then, of course, Muhammad had being a shepherd, um, familiar imagery. I was with a brother of mine behind our tents, shepherding the lambs. Two men in white raiment came to me with a gold basin full of snow. Then they seized me, opened up my belly, extracted my heart and split it. They then extracted a black drop from it and threw it away. Wow. Now, of course, uh, yeah. I was going to say, so I think we got some advice for heart surgeons here. They just need to take the heart out, wash it with some zum water, and if they see any black specks, throw those away, and then everyone will be cured of all their heart disease. 
well, that was the Satan within him. So while he was playing with his playmates, okay, Gabriel took hold of him and lay him on the ground and tore open his breast and took out his heart and extracted a blood clot. This was the part of Satan in thee. They washed it with the water of Zamzam in a golden basin. Then it was joined together and restored. Muhammad has been murdered, the boys were shouting. They all rushed towards him and found him all right. His color was changed. Anna said, I myself saw the marks of the needle on his breast. That is Sahih Muslim. Two angels came to the messenger of Allah and took him to Zamzam when they split open his stomach and took out his innards in a basin of gold, washed them with Zamzam water. Then they filled his heart with wisdom and knowledge. That's Sunan on the side. That's from the Kitab al-Sitta, right? So Muhammad's chest is open. Let's have a look at another Sirah. They took out his heart. They extracted a lump of flesh saying, this is the portion of Satan in you. Then he put Muhammad's blah, blah, you know the story. <laughs> So these are multiple different hadith and sirah that all claim that Muhammad was miraculously opened by angels or maybe Gabriel, had the evil removed from him, and then his heart filled with faith and wisdom and then sewn back up. Yeah, it's a, a very interesting suggestion there. I mean, why couldn't Allah have just created him without any satanic influence to begin with? For that matter, why does he create any human? Because the implication here is that this is true of every human, that we all have this black drop that comes from satan seems yeah. that allah is not powerful enough to create humans that are good he seems right. to also be having a, a different the, uh, the angel gabriel also seems to be having a different relationship with him kind of a love hate because on one hand he's he's taking out the evil from him but yet but yet when it comes time for him to become a prophet he's being choked in the cave and all of these things and so we don't understand you know the relationship between so, muhammad and these spirit creatures so he was 40 years old in the cave. Now, apparently when this happened, he was about four years old. Yeah. So he'd met Gabriel before, apparently as a child when this happened. Yeah. So now a lot of this is just, I want to introduce people to the material. It's a wide variety of different things that doesn't appear in the Quran, right? There are no references to it in the Quran. And notice they say, they speak of Bahira the monk, because this is how they start to imply that Christian knew about the coming of Muhammad and were awaiting it as part of their prophecy. So they talk about Bahira is a monk who apparently was in Syria, in Busra. And they met a monk called Bahira, his real name was George, who showed great kindness and entertained them lavishly. He had never been in the habit of receiving them before. He readily enough recognized the prophet and said, this is the master of all humans. So apparently a Christian monk said this. Wow. Allah will send him with a message which will bring mercy to all beings. And when you appeared from the direction of Aqaba, all stones and all the trees prostrated themselves, which they never do except for a prophet. Trees didn't do that for prophets. I can recognize him by the seal of the prophet, which is below his shoulder, like an apple. Now, different narrations say that what did the, when someone is asked, what does the seal of the prophet look like? The guy says, well, it looks like a few hairs. Right? There's actually... Oh. Yeah. Yeah, so we have learned this from our books. Do not take him to Syria for fear of the Jews. Now, again, they tell the story in a different Syria. There's, there's dozens of different Syria. I have 39 of them, right? And there's more. There's many more. A Christian monk by the name of Bahira said, this is the chief of the world and the messenger of the Lord. God has sent him as a mercy to all mankind. When he came to the past, when he came this out of the past, stones and trees bowed in prostration. I recognized him from the seal of prophethood, which lies like an apple on the soft flower. It is mentioned in our scriptures. And this is from a book called When the Moon Split, a popular Sirah of Muhammad. Do you guys thoughts? I, I, it's interesting that the, this monk supposedly told everyone that he was going to be this prophet in advance. And then yet when he actually started receiving that revelation, he had no idea he was a prophet. He thought that uh, he'd been attacked by demons and he was suicidal and uh, thought he was possessed. And so uh, very strange, given that he was told as a child that this was going to, he was going to be the prophet, that he didn't see it coming. Yeah, he, he really seems to go back and forth in his confidence. Um, and this might be a bit of a stretch too, but just as a Christian, one of the first things I thought about when I heard about uh, the prostration was Jesus um, during the, uh, uh, the, uh, Palm Sunday when he comes in and then the Pharisees tell him to be quiet and he says how the stones would cry out if, if his disciples stopped and if the crowd stopped. And that might not be a direct connection, but I think you can definitely see the parallels where yep. they're not they're not necessarily crying out, but that prostration shows how 
Muhammad is, is basically on this level much greater than any other regular human. Correct. So he was supposed to be a regular human. So they speak of the caravan was in Syria. The monk Bahaira came out against these practice to welcome them, gave them a great feast. And he saw the apostle of God. He satisfied himself with the signs of apostleship. And he said, God him from the Jews. And they took him to Mecca, right? Of course, they hate the Jews. Yeah. And he goes on to say the misery and suffering the human race endured in the world was according to the Jewish and Christian doctrines, a feeble image of the never ending agony, which made awaited man in the future world. Right. So it says that the, basically Christians have taken up this idea and humanity scared by these ghastly visions and glimpses of eternal suffering was relieved by the prophet's emphasis on God's all embracing mercy. Right now, of course, that's very interesting, except we have the punishment of the grave in Islam, where when you die, you will be tormented and tortured in the grave. And then once you leave the grave, you have to cross a chasm of fire across a blade that will cut you and slice you and you'll wow. be burned by the hellfire. Then once you get across the first bridge, and this bridge, like I said, is a blade, right? It's a fine blade which will cut you and, and the fires of hell will burn you and roast you in terror and torment as you cross on your hands and knees. Then when you get across, you have to retaliate against others, other Muslims, for their sins. You have to beat them, bite them, rip out their eyes, break their bones, punish them. And then once that is done, may you walk towards the next bridge, which takes you to paradise. Wow. So it's like a gladiator match in hell, basically. That's how Allah gets his sick kicks. Not even in hell. This is when you die and as a Muslim, you go to paradise. Wow. It's crazy. That's your salvation. So now they speak of the great religions of the world had spread the light of faith and morals and learning in the ages past. But every one of these had been rendered a disgrace to its name by the sixth century of the Christian era. Crafty innovators, unscrupulous dissemblers and impious priests distorted the scriptures and disfigured the commandments of their own religions. It was almost impossible to recall the original shape and content of the religions. So could the founder or the prophet of any of these religions return to earth, he would unquestionably have refused his own religion and denounced his followers as apostates. Of course, Judaism, blah, blah, blah. Now they mention here that Judaism is a religion upholding racial snobbery. I found multiple references to this, right? And so the manner in which the scriptures of all the great religions had been deformed and mutilated, and in most cases given an entirely false coloring, has been treated in some detail, blah, blah, blah. So this is what they teach within the Sira. This is the kind of content that you hear in the Sira. Are there any comments from the, from the audience? A lot of this is new, so it's stuff that I'm gathering and testing, and I'd like to get, get your feedback if there's anything from the audience. Uh, yeah, so Diane says, if the monk is true, sounds like he's a false prophet spirit. I've seen the odd one in church, gifted to hear and see the unseen, ego stroked by demons. Of course, the, the easy explanation is that it's simply made up. It's inconsistent with the rest of the story of Muhammad that he was supposedly told as a child he'd be a prophet. No doubt they made it up later on to try to give it some credibility that the Christians were saying this. You know, probably what really was happening is all the Christians and Jews in the area were like, what are you talking about? You're not a prophet. You don't fulfill any of our scriptures. And they're like, yeah. well, you know, uh, what about that? Christian who told me I was a prophet. I have the seal. It's in your scriptures. No, it's not. Yeah. So this is how they claim that, that we remove all these details as we discussed previously. But the thing is now, why do Muslims not want to discuss, and there are many more miracles I'll get to, but why do Muslims not want to discuss any of this with us? Why don't they make these public and plain? Why don't they talk about these miracles? Because are they true? Or do you stand behind them with 100% confidence? Why won't you talk about them? Why do you hide them? Because remember, if someone's lying about Muhammad, they're going to hell. So are these stories true? And do you stand by them? Or are these stories false? And multiple of your major scholars are all going to hell. Yeah, if I were a Muslim, it, it would feel like an intellectual minefield. Because even if I were within the camp of fellow Muslims, there's so much controversy and conflict between, you know, for instance, Hadija's age. And, and so you, you, you almost kind of get this anxiety over not wanting to say something that's wrong because you recognize the ramifications. And yet those are the only things that you have available to you. So you're being punished for the inconsistency for, for speaking on something that's false. And yet, you know, you can't help the fact that the sources are so inconsistent or con and, and are constantly contradicting each other. 
and yet you're facing the punishment for it from a law. It's very interesting. Yeah. So yeah, we have another comment from the chat. Uh, Rhea says constant lies, but the lies do sound like they're from Satan as they are sly and slippery, but easy for decent folks to see through. And I, I think that that's, you know, quite true here that the, the narratives are very carefully crafted to make someone who wants to believe them, believe them like, oh, yeah, look at all this great evidence. The Christian monk even accepted Muhammad. But if you look at it with a slight bit of critical thought, you're like, well, they just made the story up. Uh, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. What kind of impression are you guys building up from, from what is being presented here? I think some of this stands outside of the standard narrative, the narrative that holds in it. But what impression are you building up of Muhammad so far before I get to the light of Muhammad? I mean, to, to, I mean, as a Christian, I can already see the parallels with Jesus. But if I was just a random person who really didn't have a strong faith going into it, I would definitely think just from looking at these sources that Muhammad was way more than just a human prophet chosen by Allah, that he's something bigger and better than anyone else around me. And because of that, there's something inherent within himself, not just because Allah has chosen him, that would lead me to... Yeah. To, to seek him. And, and that to me makes it very complicated because then if I close these sources and then go straight to the Quran or, uh, you know, uh, mainstream Islamic figures today, they're going to say the opposite and say, no, he was just, he was just the messenger. And so exactly. it'll be very interesting. Definitely. Yeah. So here's an interesting point. Now, why do Muslims not discuss this? Well, let's have a look in the Sharia, right? Umdat al-Salik. If a Quran is purchased for someone, it is obligatory that the person be Muslim. The same is true of books of Adith and books containing the words and deeds of the early Muslims. Quran in this context means any work that contains some of the Quran, even a slight amount. This ruling holds for any religious books. So according to the Sharia, Muslims are not to be sharing and we are not to be allowed to see books from Islam. How convenient. Like, now, the scholar that harmonized, I'm going to skip over the section, the scholar that harmonized the Sharia is a man called Sha'ani. And he, he extracted six particular pillars, shall we say, of the Sharia, what the Sharia said. And one of the rules is that necessities permit the forbidden. In other words, you can lie. You can do whatever is forbidden by the law of Allah if it advances the cause of Islam. And the aims are more important than the means. In other words, the ends justify the means. That's from Sha'ani and Al-Mizan al-Kubra. So now let us skip forward. So we are not to know this. They can't share this with us. So that's why when I ask Muslims, so quote me from the Sharia, they refuse to, not one, not a single one wow. has ever done it. Not one. And I've been asking for a long time. Wow. And also Muslims are not allowed to even know these things. Remember, they're taught only the Quran. They work on the literal level called the Ibarah. And this, the Imams work on an allegorical level called the, called the Ishara. And then the One's above the imams and the ulama work on a level above them and the top element work on another level. So you've got the haqqaiq and so on. So yeah, you've got, yeah, so you've got multiple levels. So unfortunately, you're not going to get this from Muslims, but this is direct from the scholars. So let's get to the gist of it, what I was talking about. Muhammad, the light of creation. Long before the creation of the world, God took a ray of light from the splendor of his own glory and united it to the body of Muhammad. That's in the Milal Wan Nihal, pages 132 to 134, called the Nur i Muhammadi, the light of Muhammad. And God said, Thou art the elect, the chosen. I will make the members of thy family the guides to salvation. Sounds a lot like Abraham's family. <laughs> Muhammad said, The first thing which God created was my light and my spirit. And in due time, the world was created, but not until the birth of Muhammad did this ray of glory appear, the nur i Muhammadi. So your thoughts on that? Wow. Because, I mean, I, I saw this when I, when, I, when I went through it ahead of time, too. But, I mean, you reckon, I mean, again, so the, so the first thing my mind went to was John 1. Now, I know Jesus is not created, but I can still see this kind of parallel of Allah almost having this companion with him in the beginning before the world is created and so on. And uh, then, yeah, you're right. I mean, that's a great point about uh, him talking, uh, saying that uh, your family will be the guides to salvation like Abraham. And so I I'm just seeing a constant elevation uh, to put Muhammad on this level that, you know, really, he really inherently should not be. But I mean, I I'm, not, I'm not the one to determine that. I mean, these are what the scholars are saying and that gives Muslims a huge dilemma as to who exactly Muhammad is in relation to Allah. 
Well, don't forget the Quran says there's come to you from Allah a light and a clear book. And that light yeah. apparently is Muhammad. So let's have a look. The primordial light is what is called the light of the prophet. He's the created being who received the major share of the light of Allah. This is how the prophet may say, I was a prophet when Adam was still between spirit and body, right? So let's continue. The Kitabi Ahwal i Kiamat, we read the following account. It is recorded that God first created a tree with 4,000 branches and he called it the tree of life. Then he created the light of Muhammad in a veil of white pearl. And he placed it upon that tree where it praised Allah for 70,000 years. So Muhammad praised Allah for 70,000 years. And, the, and then it goes on, right? Then the Kaaba was created, and we'll get to that later, apparently as the very first house of worship in history, right? Yeah. And then he created, Allah created the people of the believing men and women, the Muslims of both sectors. He then created the spirits of the Jews, the Christians, the Magi, right? The Magi, whatever. He created the earth, so don't forget, Muhammad was created before the earth was made. After this, when the light of Muhammad had praised God for 70,000 years, Allah created the light of the prophets out of the light of Muhammad. So he took a piece. So Allah was made, sorry, Muhammad was made of a piece of Allah. But all the prophets from Abraham, Noah, Jesus, David, etc. were all made out of a piece of Muhammad. Wow. They looked upon that light and created their spirits, and they said, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the apostle of Allah. All the prophets that came before Muhammad, all were Muslims and gave their fealty to Muhammad. Then God created a lamp, and he played and made the figure of Muhammad, and he placed Muhammad on that lamp, just as he afterwards was in this world, right? Exactly in the form he had when he was saying his prayers. Then the spirits... When they say the spirits in a different text, in a different book, and I don't have time to go through all the books, basically they're saying that all the spirits of man, all the unborn spirits of mankind, all of mankind and all the angels and all the denizens of paradise went around the light of Muhammad, praising and worshiping him for the space of 100,000 years. So, so, so Muhammad is at least 170,000 years old. Correct. And he wow. was praised longer than he praised Allah. Then God commanded the spirits to look upon the form of Muhammad, and they all obeyed. Who saw Muhammad's head became a caliph and a sultan. Who saw his forehead became a just commander. Who saw his eyes became one who knows the word of God, blah, blah, blah. And those who saw nothing, who looked away, those who saw nothing became a Jew and a Christian. Wow. So, yeah, and an infidel and a magician. Right? One of the first things I thought of, too, regarding the tree was Genesis oddly enough when it talked about uh, uh Allah creating the tree of life and putting Muhammad there in the center of it and, and you know worshiping him for 70,000 years again there might not be a direct parallel there but that was just immediately what my mind went to and you know in Genesis the tree is kind of seen as this one thing in creation well that you had the you had the, the the tree of knowledge of good and evil and then the tree of life yeah and the tree of life it seems like this good thing that you know you that you can uh and enjoy and rejoice in and it's kind of like that choice thing in the garden of eden and yet that's the exact same level that muhammad seems to be being placed on here yeah so that we is have, good we, uh, we have a comment from jeffrey he says there's a slight possibility that muhammad meaning the praised one was a title for jesus among a gnostic sect in the middle east um, whether or not the the title was used for jesus i think that there is some solid evidence that the writings that make up the Quran, a lot of them were originally written about Jesus, yep. and then they're just changed. Remember, the, the name Muhammad only appears four times in the Quran, so the name's not necessarily particularly important, but a lot of times when you look at these passages that are about the so-called messenger, and you think about them from a Christian perspective, you're like, yeah, I can see how this was originally a story about Jesus that they took and slightly modified. You know, it might not be a true story about Jesus, but it, it could be someone's, uh, you know, made up story that they were just telling themselves for fun. And it was taken into the Quran. And then eventually it was attributed to be about Muhammad, even though it wasn't intended to be that way. Right. That makes good sense. So just that these things have not really been investigated. And I just want to bring up, pardon me, various things to so people have an idea of what's what's out there and what Muslims refuse to discuss and what we need to be looking at and asking them about this. Again, the implication being that if they're lying about Muhammad and these people are going straight to hell, then why are they trusting their top scholars? Yeah, great point. 
right? This is written by people like Ibn Kathir, Ibn Abbas, I mean, top names, right? Now, when Muhammad was born, right, there are multiple stories, and I'm not going to go into every one again. A voice reached my ears, okay? And voices spoke and said, you know, the Lord show mercy unto thee. And of course, when Muhammad was born, the earth became so illuminated that I could see some of the palaces of Damascus by that light. Damascus was 1,300 kilometers from Mecca. Okay, 1,300, 800 miles. Wow. So, uh, so yeah, apparently now they're lying about Muhammad, right? So this is by S.W. Kohler, who collected a lot of this together. So it's called, in a chapter called Muhammad, a parody of Christ, right? So now the learned doctors of religion differ as to which thing was the first of the creatures. Some regard reason, Logos, others the pen, the Kalam, and others again, the light of Muhammad's prophetship as the first thing created by Allah. But let's go on. Let's see what some other scholars tell us. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, blah, 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 the nur, the light is created. When Allah intended to create the creatures, he first created the light of Muhammad, right? And this is quoted through, here's the chain of narrators, and Allah created first of all the light of Muhammad. He said, you are my chosen one and the trustee of my light and guidance. It is because of you, Muhammad, that I am going to create the earth and the skies. I will lay down reward and punishment and bring into being the garden and the fire, paradise and hell. Because of Muhammad, Allah will create the earth and paradise and hell. They go on to speak about the family of the prophet, about the creation of the angels, of the souls, of the world, and of the covenant taken from the souls of man, which combined the belief in the one God, Allah, with acceptance of Muhammad's prophethood. All souls before their birth, a hundred thousand years ago, said the Shahada. This is yeah. something interesting because, and, and Lloyd, correct me if I'm wrong about this, but when you were earlier talking about how uh, Allah put the light of Muhammad in the lamp and then the spirits encircled it, it said that he commanded the spirits to look upon Muhammad and then those that didn't became Jews and Christians. And yes. yet here it is saying that the souls all before their you know existence, like as physical people, um, they believed in the one God. They, be they accepted Muhammad's prophethood. And yet we see during that time, during those hundred thousand years, apparently some didn't because they became Jews and Christians. <laughs> Dude, that's a very good point. I don't know. I just was like, no, that, no, really, that's a great point. Um, your thoughts, that is, before I add in my two cents. Yeah, I was going to say that uh, Raya commented they just tried to do a copy of each Jesus story, but change it to Muhammad. It's pathetic, and I was thinking that that was perfect description of this so-called light passage. It's basically a retelling of John one. Yeah, Jesus is the light. Jesus, the world was created by and and through jesus for jesus and now somehow it's all it's created through muhammad for muhammad and it's it, it really feels like it's just a someone heard the the christians talking about jesus you know they probably weren't they didn't necessarily say i'm reading john one but they're talking about the ideas found in john one and like hey you know those are some good ideas let's just use those and say they're about muhammad yeah, and there's no consistency. They all contradict each other. All these different scholars in these sira contradict each other. And these are supposed to be all authentic narrations. And it's then, of course, you go to a different set of books that say, no, this narration is not authentic. That one's... What do you believe? They can't get the age of his wife right. <laughs> right? So, now, even, an, uh, even Abbas narrates that, again, I was a prophet when Adam was between soul and body. So, now we're talking about Adam. When Adam's creation was in its prelim stages, that's when Muhammad was already a prophet, right? Now, they don't mean prophet. When they say prophet, they don't mean it the way we understand it. Yeah, but notice, that's... Muhammad's light adorned the throne of God. Later, Muhammad's light was put into Adam's forehead, and it continued its journey generation after generation through numerous prophets, until it came to the prophet Abraham. From Abraham, it came to his eldest son, the prophet Ishmael. Muhammad's light is contained in every single prophet. And I've got a bunch of notes here. I'm not going to go through the sources. So again, the Quran states, there's come to you a light from Allah, right? And the, in the metaphysics of the Sufis, and this is Masood that's here in UK, the prophet is both the light of Allah and a human being. Jesus is both a God 
and the human. Two natures. Muhammad is the light of Allah and the human being. Interesting. And the ability to join between the two aspects or the inability to join between the two aspects is a lack of understanding of the greatness of al haqiqa al muhammadiyah the Muhammadan reality. Now, just to highlight, basic Muslims, your average Muslim is at the Ibadah level, right? This is what the scholars term the lowest level of understanding, the literal. The Imams are at the Ishara, the allegorical. Then you have the, uh, I can't remember the third one, um, which is the, uh, it'll come to me later. And the fourth level is the Haqqaiq, right? The sublime level. That's for the highest those are for the prophets. Those are for the what they call the saints of Islam, the highest of their scholars. So here they're talking about, hold on, if, if we can have a trinity and if Jesus can have two aspects, then so can Muhammad, except Muhammad is just a human and Jesus is fake, but Muhammad has two aspects. Uh, you guys, please explain. It, it's very hypocritical, too, because a common objection you'll hear from Muslims is that the trinity can't be true because, you know, God's not an author of confusion and, you know, this is too hard for us to understand and, and things like that. And yet they're more than willing to affirm it about Muhammad, despite having the same dilemma on their hands. You know, how can Muhammad both be the light of Allah and a human being? How can he have those two uh, distinct natures? So they're very willing to accept it when it affirms their own ideology, but never when it's in the contrary. Yeah. And Thaddeus, see this point here? What do you think of that? This is the author of this book. Well, what are your thoughts there? Uh, I don't have. Oh, sorry. Well, okay. Uh, sorry, so that is the same author as uh, wrote the most popular Sharia manual, yes? This is the author and translator of the most famous Sharia manual in the world, on earth, okay? This is the most authoritative, this guy translated and added to the most famous Sharia manual on earth, one of the top scholars of Islam alive today, and he made that statement that Muhammad is both light and a human being. Now, if he's lying about Muhammad, and we're going to get into some other stories, right? That we'll get. Again, I'll come back to some other before things. Before you so, go on, before you go on, I wanted to comment on that that last story about how the light was apparently passed on from person to person. Yeah. Apparently, they're viewing the prophethood as some sort of genetic trait, or you know, obviously they didn't know about genetics, but something pseudo genetic here. And I, this is important because I. I I've heard this before. I know I don't think it's in the presentation, but they make a big deal in the biographies of Muhammad how, you know, he had all these children, but they were all either girls or they died as young children. Right. None of them lived to adulthood, and that's because the prophethood apparently would have been passed on to a male heir. So the fact he didn't have any male heirs, he was the final prophet. It means he's the final prophet, exactly. Right. So, yeah, so his light, as I said, adorns the throne of God, right? This is how important he is. He is basically, yeah, anyway, you figure that out. So now Muhammad's mother says in the Sira, when he was born, there was a light that issued out of my pudenda. That would be her vajayjay. And it lit the palaces of Syria, Syria sorry, of Busra and Syria, right? There are multiple reports for this. Again, 1,300 kilometers away. That's a really strong light. Okay. And you got to ask, was she lying down under blankets at the time? <laughs> you know, it was controversially reported that significant pre precursors accompanied Muhammad's birth. 14 galleries of, um, this is Kosla, this is Caesar, Caesar's palace, right? Cracked and rolled down. The Magian's sacred fire, which had been burning for a thousand years, died down and churches, 14 churches as well, I think. Some churches on the Lake Sawa sank down and collapsed. So when Muhammad was born, churches broke and collapsed. Caesar's palace at the time, I don't know if it was Julius Caesar, but Caesar's palace split. And uh, yeah, Ibn Sa'd reported that Muhammad's mother said when he was born, there was a light that issued out of my pudendum and lit the palaces of Syria. Ahmad, Ibn Ahmad, this is the founder of the Hanbali school of jurisprudence, Ahmad. It was but controversially reported that 14 galleries of Kisra's palace cracked and rolled down the Megan's fire, blah, blah. That's from the sealed nectar, Ar-Rahik al-Maktoum, a very, very well-respected Sarah manual. So when one morning a Jew in Yatrib began shouting for the attention of his people, the star has risen beneath which Ahmad will be born this night. And they heard the Jew Yushu say, the time approaches for the coming of a prophet named Ahmad who will arise a man neither short nor tall with fine light eyes and he wears a full cloak and he rides a donkey and he carries his sword over his shoulder. 
Yeah, it sounds a little familiar there. That it does. And then someone says, is only Yushu saying that? All the Jews of Yatrib. I think Yatrib is the old name for Medina, the previous name. All the Jews of Yatrib are saying the same. And the red star has risen and it ever only rises on the departure or emergence of a prophet. And the only one left is Ahmad. Okay. And a priest of Syria once told me, a prophet has come in your land. While he was arriving, his star arose. So go home, believe in him and follow him. That's coming directly from Matthew 2, where we see the star of Bethlehem uh, appear in the sky for uh, surrounding Jesus's birth and the, the arrival of the wise men and all these things. And this one, I mean, I, I, I hope that Christians watching were able to catch that because it's becoming blatantly obvious while certain ones were more subtle. Yeah, yeah over talking. and over again, we just we see all these images from Christianity, mostly about Jesus, all stolen and used to describe Muhammad. And, you know, if, if they, all these miraculous signs accompanied Muhammad, you know, the d destruction of churches and the uh, moon shining all night or whatever, and all these things happened. Um, why, is, why didn't anyone record these? You know, some of these things would have been seen worldwide. Others at least affected some non-Muslim society or non-Arabian society. Why didn't they record these things in their history books? It's a Exactly. Uh, just a mystery, I guess. Exactly. I, I have to ask this very same question. Um, so look, I know I'm repeating some things. Again, this is new. I've never really spoken about this outside of chats with Thaddeus personally. And, and just brief introductions to it. So um, yeah, so okay. So again, they repeat the same thing. The 14 balconies of the palace, right? The, the And Lake Sawa emptied. The lake emptied itself, right? And then the Bedouin said, he met me when he was walking between Abu Bakr and Umar. I followed them until they came to a Jew holding and reading the Torah, consoling himself with it at the death of a son. The messenger of God asked him, do you see in your scripture any description of me and my place of origin? The man made a gesture with his head, meaning no. But his dead son spoke, saying, but yes, by him who sent down the Torah, we do find in our scriptures a description of you and of your place of origin, I bear witness that there's no God but Allah, and that you are the messenger of Allah. Wow. And he said, keep away from the Jew, your brother. <laughs> oh, goodness. Wow. Amazing. Uh, th this poor guy lost his son, and then they, his son says, uh, stay away from my dad. He's a Jew. <laughs> 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 His dead son spoke to Muhammad. This chain of authorities is excellent and there are testimonies to its veracity in the Sahih from Anas B. Malik. This would be the Maliki school of fiqh, the founder. Moving on. So I hope people are understanding there's a lot more to Muhammad than we have been led to believe. And I'm just, I've got like three dozen different books. I'm just grabbing stuff and just sticking it in here so everyone can get a, an understanding of who Muhammad is in Islam. This is what they're learning from the age of five. That Muhammad is a God, that he's Jesus, that he is the Messiah. And we'll go on. If we go further, it's a given time. He is the King Messiah. He is predicted. Anyway, so the prophet, he gazed yeah. uh, We've had a number of comments from the, the chat. First of all, uh, Wooter left a super chat, no message, just a super chat. Wow. So thank you very much for that. Um, Raya said, I take it by the time it came to Muhammad, there was no light left. I guess the the light of the prophets got weaker and weaker over a time or something. Candle. Uh, let's see. William pointed out that the Quran will become a man on judgment day. That's also true. You know, going back to what you said at the beginning, that there's this Islamic trinity of Muhammad, Allah, and the Quran, and the Quran will take on flesh in the end days. And that the word is will take on flesh. Mm. Yep. <laughs> uh, let's see what else have we got here. Uh, Diane said that Jesus is the light. So again, Satan is counterfeiting our God's identity. Absolutely. Right. Uh, I think that's good. Go ahead and you can move on. Yeah. And uh, so a Jew says in what, you, so Muhammad speaks to a Jew in what you read of the Torah and the gospel. Do you find me to be a prophet? The man answered, we do find a description of you and of your place of origin. Do you know me as the messenger of Allah? The prophet asked. Yes, indeed, by God, the Jew responded. My people know what I know. You are fully apparent in the Torah, but they are envious. Wow. 
right? So he doesn't want to accept Muhammad because his people will hold him back, right? Muhammad bin Ishaq from Muhammad bin blah, 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 the companion and the brother of Moses. So Muhammad is the companion and the brother of Moses, the corroborator of the message that Moses brought. God stated to you, O Jews, the people of the Torah, you will find in your book the fact that Muhammad is the messenger of God and those who are with him are violent against unbelievers, compassionate among themselves. Yeah, now, this is normally translated as harsh or hard, but the older translations use the word violent. So God revealed to David in the book of Psalms, oh David, there will come after you a prophet named Ahmad and Muhammad, a truthful man, a Lord. I will never be angry with him. That's God speaking to David. I have forgiven him before he disobeyed me, both his previous and later sins. David, I have given preference to Muhammad and to his nation above all nations. Apparently, these words were in the Bible. I must have missed them. I don't know. I'm reading in uh, in uh, First Samuel right now with David, and I haven't gotten to that point yet, so I'll keep an eye out. We'll see. Right. Yeah. Your mind is, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, I, you know, I wonder how they managed, how the all these bad Jews and Christians managed to go back and delete this text from manuscripts that were written before Muhammad's time. And there's no evidence in any of those manuscripts that words have been deleted. Yeah. But it's quite, this is quite a miracle what, of Islam, I guess. Agreed. Uh, but this is what they are teaching. This is what this is why Muslims do not want to discuss this with us. They can't. And it's difficult for them to start explaining all of this, this volume of stuff. The Almighty said, making reference to the priests and the monks, and when they hear what was revealed to the messenger, you see their eyes overflow with tears for they recognize the truth. Christian monks, when they hear Muhammad speak his words, they cry because it's so true and so whatever. In the notes relating to the lives of the prophets, right, there is their descriptions of the mission of the messenger, of his towns of birth and refuge. These occur in the accounts of Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, and others. Now, I didn't go through the whole thing, but this is in Ibn Kathir, The Life of the Prophet Muhammad, Volume 1. Ibn Kathir is one of the major scholars wow. of Islam, one of the top, top scholars of Islam. So the very night in which Muhammad was born, a quake shook the palace of Caesar in Persia. Fourteen turrets fell, and again, they go on and on. And a light of such intensity was seen that the entire world from east to west became illuminated. Either this happened and there's proof for it, and they stand by it and are willing to discuss these Gospels of Muhammad, or... This person lied and is going straight to hell. So Muhammad splits the moon in two. The moon was, was split in two, according to Bukhari, right? Again, according to Bukhari, and again, according to Bukhari. And the moon was split in two, according to Bukhari, and then Muslim, and then again, Bukhari, right? So, yeah. Now, I'll skip over this section. But any questions so far? I've got to, I'll move uh, on to the well, second I wanted to, I wanted to point out something here. Of course, the the average Muslim is going to be inclined to say, well, these people were lying, but they don't quite, uh, they need to think about the implication of that because these are the only sources we have for Muhammad. These are the same people who are transmitting the Quran. If they are liars, uh, then you have no religion. <laughs> you, can't just, you can't just say, well, I believe some of the things they said. Uh, well, I mean, if they're lying about Muhammad, then according to Muhammad, they are going straight to hell, unless I guess that was also a lie. Um, so you have nothing left. It's like you can't just reject some things that a person said and then be like, oh, well, but everything else he said is 100 percent true, even though he's the worst possible kind of liar. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Yeah. 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 And, and um, oh, go ahead. Uh, uh, go ahead and share your thought. And then I just had a comment from the chat to read. I was just going to say, and you know, as, as crazy as all this stuff is, when I, when, when I examine these things and I hear Lloyd present them, I, I, I don't even blame the Muslims who then go around and say, oh, well, you know, the Bible's changed or, you know, uh, Jesus was really a Muslim. And they make all these crazy claims about, uh, you know, uh, historical figures in Christianity and in Judaism. And as crazy as these claims are, you know, I don't even blame them when this is what they're being taught from age five in Dawah. It's like, you know, yeah, they may not want to discuss it and, and do all these things, but when you get these type of ideas and teachings into someone uh, that young, if you get them into their head at that age, then they can only come out of a system like that, assuming these things about Christianity and then trying to present them against Christians. But they have a rude awakening when they realize that no, and they want to fight against that because it's all they've known. 
Yeah, I mean, if it was actually true that Jews and Christians had changed the scriptures just to remove Muhammad's name, then no doubt they would be quite evil people. The problem is there's no actual evidence that that ever happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, New and Learner right. says, how can the light of Allah recite the satanic verses? The light of Allah cannot distinguish between angel and Satan. I don't get it. And uh, neither do I. It's yet another contradiction here. Wasn't that part of your presentation as well? It might be later, though. But... Might be later. But, but yeah, the Senate verses come later, but exactly. So I'm trying to do a brief overview. I mean, I, I've got to set up, I'm using like 30 different books or something, and I'm just pulling different pieces out just to give people an overview of the Muhammad that, that we don't know, that Muslims are taught. And from the sources, from the top scholarly sources, the various Sira. But also we as Christians have this view, and apologists, I think, need to understand that because Christianity has the Bible and exclusively the Bible as a source, they believe that the Quran is the same within Islam. The Quran is a very minor, minor, tiny, microscopic part of Islamic scripture. It might be the ultimate source, ultimately, but it's like a seed. And then you've got this forest, right? You've got, so understand, Islam is really the Sharia and all the other books. It's, it's okay. really, um, there's so much more beyond the Quran. The Quran is not, it's not complete. It's not detailed. The Shahada, which has Muhammad in it, it's not in the Quran, for instance. So let us go. One, one more comment from the chat before we go on. Uh, Jeffrey says, how did the Christians manage to change all the manuscripts in different languages, Greek, Latin, Syriac, Coptic, Emmeric, etc. at once? It's so ridiculous, but Muslims still believe it. And absolutely, the Bible had already been translated into, you know, around a dozen languages by the time Muhammad mm -hmm. came. Somehow all these manuscripts and all these languages were all changed, including manuscripts that we didn't even know existed until the 1900s. <laughs> I mean, the Dead Sea Scrolls, so yeah. So here's a question. So I've asked Muslims this, and um, as you guys know, I'm very, I'm very active in the chat. Some people say I'm a little too abrasive in the chat, but anyway, the question is, what is Islam? Let us go to the Sharia and Fiqh. Now, look, I tend to use these words interchangeably. They're not exactly the same thing, but for our purposes, they may as well be the same thing, right? The Sharia, the Fiqh, whatever. We can get into a discussion on that another day. So chapter U2 of the world's most famous Sharia manual, the most common Sharia manual on earth says, Islam is to testify that there is no God but Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. That is the formal orthodox definition of Islam for all four schools of jurisprudence, including the Jafari school of Shia Islam. Chapter two, his messenger, 2-1. Allah, most high, sent Muhammad to deliver his inspired message to the entire world. This is the Sharia. There is no discussion. There is no debate. Mm -hmm. The Sharia is the final interpretation of Islam. It is the final word. There is no other authority. Arabs and non-Arabs, jinn and mankind. Okay, so Muhammad was sent to everything that exists. It supersedes, Islam supersedes and abrogates all previous religious systems with the Sharia, the sacred law of Muhammad, right? Except for the provisions that the new revelation reconfirmed. And it says here in the Sharia, belief in Allah alone is insufficient, wow. right? Allah has favored Muhammad above all other prophets. He's just a normal guy. He's, there's no preference in prophets, but the Sharia tells us he is above all other prophets. He is the highest of mankind. Rejecting anyone attesting to the divine oneness by saying, so in other words, sorry, Allah rejects anyone who prays to him unless they also attest to the prophet saying Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. So you can say that there is no God but Allah, but Allah ignores and rejects your prayer and your faith and your worship unless you also say Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Muhammad. Yeah. This, uh, it, it's oddly eerie of Hebrews 1 almost, you know, where it talks about the Father placing Jesus above all the angels, above all, you know, uh, above, above all creation because of his willingness to go to the cross. And we see this kind of same language adopted for Muhammad as well, saying that Allah has favored him above all other prophets and made him the highest of mankind. Um, and it's funny because again, if you just would replace divine oneness with say divine Trinity and then replace Muhammad with Jesus, you literally have the same thing except Jesus being eternal and more so. 
And yet again, Muslims are so quick to accept this and I mean, and accept this and then reject uh, things like the Trinity and such because of its supposed incoherence, which is insane. Right. Your thoughts that is, you're going to say? Yeah, I wanted to ask what kind of God requires a, a mere human being to do anything, but it says right there, Allah requires Muhammad. He couldn't have accomplished his aims if he didn't have Muhammad. And I think that's that's true because Allah is can't enter into creation, right? So he act, absolutely needs human beings to do his will because that's yep. the only way it can be done. Uh, he's too weak or whatever to enter into creation. Of course, that's Muslims wouldn't say weak, but creation. that's how I see it. Yeah, Satan can enter into Allah's creation, but Allah can enter into his own creation. Mm -hmm. So the Sharia goes on to say, Allah has obliged men and jinn to believe everything the Prophet has informed us mm -hmm. concerning this world and the next, and does not accept anyone's faith unless they believe in what he has told us will happen after death. So Muhammad is the most like Jesus. Muhammad says, I am the most akin to Jesus Christ among the whole of mankind. Whoa. That is Sahih Muslim. Both in this world and in the hereafter, I am the nearest of all people to Jesus, the son of Mary. Their mothers are different, but their religion is one. That's Bukhari. There's a couple of interesting things with that. Um, one, why aren't the other prophets also equally near to Jesus if it's supposedly just a brotherhood of prophets or whatever? Mm -hmm. Two, it's kind of implicitly acknowledging how the, the superiority of Jesus, he's saying, you know, I'm I'm almost as good as Jesus. I, I'm as close as a human being can be. And, and then he's better. Yeah, it's crazy. Your thoughts, um, Ayo? You look a little stunned. Yeah, I'm just because I'm genuinely like reading this, and like I'm just kind of analyzing what's being said. Is it, it's very interesting because one one verse that my mind defaulted to, one verse that my mind defaulted to was, um, and this is uh, within Islam where it talks about. Mary being part of the Trinity and things like that. And it completely misrepresents, uh, you know, the Christian view on that. And then yet again, we see Muhammad willing to appeal to them despite having false views about them to affirm his own, his, his own status and his own prophethood, which is just insane to me. Right. So Muslims are required to believe in Allah's inspired books, which are revealed to his messengers, right? They have to believe that these are the word of Allah, the most high, and that they contain the truth. The obligation of belief applies to the original revelations, however, not the scriptures in the hands of non-Muslims, which are all corrupt in their present form. That's in the Sharia, section U3.4 in the Umdat al-Salik. Of course. And this does not contradict the final coming of Jesus, since Jesus will not rule according to the gospel, but as a follower of our prophet. The wow. faith of the Christian, yeah, Jesus will serve Muhammad. So this is in the Sharia, Umdat al-Salik section 09.8. Jesus. Yeah, and, and, and so Thaddeus, that, that relates pretty well to what you just said, because he's appealing to Jesus as, as if, you know, Jesus is this higher standard that he's trying to reach. And then yet, I mean, just to, just scrolling down a bit, we see how he inverts that and then places Jesus essentially under his feet to try and affirm his own status. Yeah. So he's going to appeal to Jesus whenever it works, and he's trying to work with some groups like Jews and Christians, but then he's going to put him under his feet when it comes to eschatology and, and trying to affirm his own status. It's very pick and yeah. choose. So we see that with Muslims today, and I guess I can see where they get it from. But notice, yeah, I, I had the wrong. same thought that we see that today, that the Muslims are very quick to say they respect Jesus when they're talking to mm -hmm. a, a Christian or, you know, if they're talking to a Jew, I, I bet you they're not saying we respect Jesus. They're saying we respect Abraham and we respect Moses or Jesus. Uh, you know, or if they're talking to some person from a different religion, they won't mention either one of those things. It's like, take yeah. whatever you need. Uh, the end justifies the means, as Lloyd said earlier. And it doesn't matter if it's true or not. Just tell them that you do. And uh, maybe they'll be like, oh, we're not that different. Maybe I should consider Islam. Yeah. We also had a comment in the chat to go and subscribe to you guys' this channel. So I went ahead and put those links in the uh, chat box. They're also in the video description box. I forgot to mention that when we first started. So when we're done, make sure to check out Lloyd and Io's channels. Yeah, I. so I'll finish here and then maybe we can open up to a few minutes of discussion. But Christians and Jews are supposed to follow the gospel and the Torah, okay? But it was only valid 
and acceptable to Allah until the coming of Muhammad. Those who did not then give up and follow Muhammad are lost. In other words, going to hell. No one's way or spiritual works on earth are acceptable to Allah unless they conform to the sacred law of Muhammad. doesn't say the sacred law of Allah, the Sharia of mm. Muhammad. It's a good and, point. You know, so yeah, should I should I pause there for a minute because it, because I mean I'll be going on to talk about how they slowly start to diminish the status of Jesus and elevate the status of Muhammad and bring in lots of miracles and lots of things. But yeah, has that opened a new chapter in the discussion about who Muhammad is? Yeah, I think that's a good stopping point for today. Um, we'll open up for discussion a little bit, and then we need to be off in fifteen minutes yeah. or so. So I think that's a good. Uh, stopping place for today, but we'll definitely pick this back up. And we'll, when we pick it back up, we're going to see how the, so far we've seen that some of the attributes of Jesus and some of the uh, language used to describe Jesus was borrowed. And then we're going to see how the deeds of Jesus were borrowed, how Muslims claim that, later Muslims claim that uh, Muhammad worked miracles very similar to Jesus despite the Quran saying over and over again, I'm just a warner, I, I can't yeah. work a miracle, you wouldn't believe if I did work a miracle. It, it's very, as we've seen numerous, numerous times that, you know, there's this Muhammad in the Quran, and then there's this Muhammad in all the other materials, and it's the Muhammad in the other materials that the vast majority of Muslims today believe in. Yeah, agreed. And they talk about it, but they will never tell us about the books. And why not? If this is true, why don't they discuss it? Why are they hiding it? And if it's not true, then it's lying about Muhammad. Then these people are going to hell. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's just, does any of this make sense? You know, it's, yeah. it feels like these, uh, the, the vibe I almost get from it are like these kind of, uh, exclusive stories or these exclusive kind of accounts that you know you can't really discuss unless you're in the club unless you're a muslim and i think part of that is because it helps feel them it helps give them a sense of superiority but on the other hand i think that they know deep down that the second they put these things out into the public that these accounts will just get eviscerated by christians atheists anyone who can clearly see i mean even half of the contradictions and inconsistencies that we pointed out and so I think it allows them to just kind of coddle it in their little in their little clique and in their little circle because they know the second they put it out for the masses, they won't be able to do that anymore because they'll just get eviscerated. Yeah, no, I, I think so. I've asked them for many. I, I asked them, please tell me about this. And they refuse, refuse to discuss any of it. Mm -hmm. So uh, Lika asks, what's the gradings in the hadiths? Are some true and some half true? It's either authentic or not. So I think this is a general question about how the grading of hadith works. Yeah, so you have the top level, which is considered sahih, which is considered to be 99% probability of being true. Then you have the, um, oh, good grief, no, my memory is failing me. Uh, you have sahih, and then you have... Um, oh, Hassan. Say so again? Hassan. Hassan, yeah, sorry. Then you have Hassan. Then you've got Da'if and then you have Maudu. And then you have combinations. You can have something that's Hassan Sa'i, right? So you can have combinations of those. And then, of course, you have Matruk and various others that are rejected. So your Maudu is false, fabricated. Da'if is weak. Now, a Da'if hadith has an 85% probability, according to the scholars. And that is the formal scholarship of the best scholars of Al-Azhar University and Al-Medina University, which are the two prime locations of the study of Islam in the world, right? These are the two top Islamic seminaries on earth. And which is why Barack Obama, for instance, when he visited uh, the Arab world to do his speech, he went to Al-Azhar, it's the prime seat of Arabic Islamic learning. So a, a Da'if hadith, which they claim is weak, has an 85% probability of being true. So when a Muslim tells you it's a weak hadith, he has no idea what he's talking about. Yeah, uh, up to 85%, right? So, uh... Somewhere oh, between yeah. like 55 and, or 60. And 45, 45, well, 45 and 85. 45, and, but either way, more probable that it's true than that. They treat it as like a trump card that they can just throw out and then yeah. all of a sudden it, it holds the, no weight. But the Sharia references multiple Da'if Hadith. The Sharia itself references multiple weak Hadith as true, as ultimately totally reliable. Especially if a Da'if, now look, there's, there's a whole complexity here, right? 
But if a da'if hadith references Muhammad, it is considered true. Mm. Right? Because they can't lie about Muhammad. Not, not supposed to. And then even a Maldu hadith that is false has up to a 45% chance of being true. And they say that some scholars have made mistakes. So a, a hadith could well be true. The guy could be a liar, but he might have told the truth in this case. Or he could be wrong. Wow. So even a false hadith, I can read you the formal definition from a different book. At another time, I can read it to you. But if you read the translation of the uh, Fat al-Bari from Al-Azhar and, and um, it's, in, it's in the first, I think it's on page 12 in the translation of the Fat al-Bari, the English translation, easy to find. They explain it there in two or three paragraphs, makes perfect sense. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how the... Uh, most authoritative scholars, the, the biggest experts in Islamic history tell us something is Sahih, meaning greater than 99% true. And then we see in a, a comment from a Muslim, oh, we, we don't believe that. That's not very likely to be true. We believe in the Quran and it contradicts the Quran. It's like, well, actually it doesn't contradict the Quran. And even if it did, the scholars already decided it was 99% probability of being true. So who are you to tell me otherwise? Yeah, can I appreciate yeah, I, it too? I did look for scholarship from the Muslims that comment in the YouTube comment section, but I couldn't find any of their books. Uh, might have to keep looking, Lloyd, I don't know. I don't know, man, I'm from Africa, you know, I don't know what, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's, that was a great presentation though. And yeah, I mean, I definitely hope the Muslims think about it, that the Christians, you know, really took it in as well, because. I'm sure it was new for 99% of them. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it was a very interesting presentation, but also had incredibly huge ramifications, um, I, especially the part where you mentioned yourself, how you were asking for, um, what was it you said that you asked Muslims to uh, tell you about things from the Sharia or for some, from something else? And like, you you haven't even had one Muslim. The Sharia and the Sira, they refuse. The Sira, yeah. cases, they will not, they absolutely will not discuss them with me. I'll ask yeah. them about these miracles. I'll say, look, in this book, and they refuse used to even give me that they'll say it's false and i'll say but that book's bad i'll say so which one should i read and they will not tell me at no wow. stage but don't forget the sharia also states that they are not to share any of the sharia with us if we're not there to convert and to use it for a for a sound purpose in other words to basically become a muslim if we are there to critique it then this is an unsound and unlawful purpose and they must not give us any information that's specifically stipulated in the sharia that's a huge red flag, you know, because you want to support the, the, I, I guess the word would be the cross-examination, you know, the, the constant examining and the constant um, critiquing of these sources, because ultimately that's how you know whether or not it's true. And yet Allah doesn't seem too interested in that. Neither does Muhammad. Um, and again, we see that, we see so many of these patterns even today with the Muslims. And so, yeah. Uh, so Jeffrey says he joined the stream late. What's the name of the book Lloyd is using? Uh, there's mentioned... multiple different ones. Uh, yes, but numerous what are the main books. Ones? I will mention a couple of names in the comments. So have a look at, um, I'll mention, I'll, I'll rattle off. For the Sharia, the simplest and most accessible one I would recommend is the Umdat al-Salik, also known as the Reliance of the Traveler. It is the most common, the most, this is the single most authoritative, the most highly endorsed from the, from the most authoritative Islamic centers, um, Book of Islamic Sacred Law, is the Umdat al-Salik, the Reliance of the Traveler. Get that, read through it. It's a reference work. It is really powerful. Then you're looking at, for, for the Sira, look at the Ash Shifa. There's two different versions of it that I have. A-S-H space S-H-I-F-A. That's one of them. And there's numerous. There's Sira Trazulala from Guillaume. There's, there's, no, there's numerous. Any Sira will do, really. Um, look for when the moon split. Try that one. That one's supposed to be really sound and authentic. You can hear how the moon was split in two, right? In the Ashifa, you can learn how Muhammad led trees by the, by the hand and walked with the trees and the rocks to go take a dump in the desert. And the trees and the rocks surrounded him and covered him and hid him. And then they walked back afterwards, not leaving a trace of. What, and, what was that or, one, um, the, the scholarly work pointing out some of the things that Muslims believe that aren't actually supported by. Oh, Eddie by and, evidence. Yeah. Um, yeah, let me get that. So it is called. Um, Famous, okay, so you can search for it. It's famous but unauthentic stories from the Sira of Prophet Muhammad. I will try and paste the name. So famous but unauthentic. 
stories from the Sira of Prophet Muhammad. If you search for that, you'll find the reference, you'll find the book. What I can do is I will link to some to an archive with these later on in the comments. Okay. The the proper name is what is commonly spread but not proven from the Sira of the Prophet Muhammad. And I will link that. It's the same book. And there's numerous different volumes I have grabbed from multiple ones here. But just to hopefully give people an overview, I hope people gained a great understanding of that there's so much more to Islam and Muhammad than than if we just look at the Quran. And Muslims, as you know, if you've watched the comments, if you listen to them, spoken to them, this stuff is not in the Quran, and they only talk about the Quran, but clearly they know and believe everything that I've just spoken about. Um, is that, would that be a correct statement to make that use? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that, you know, most Muslims have necessarily read these sources, but they've certainly absorbed the ideas. They're certainly aware of the ideas from, you know, the, their school teachings and whatnot. Yeah. You know, I mean, anytime someone says that Muhammad is the, the perfect example and that he never sinned and that he was you know, such a lovely person and whatnot, that all comes from the Sira. You don't find yeah. that. Oh, wow. Yeah, you got to read what they say about him. They put him on a pedestal. And, oh, my gosh. And then why is that true when there's very little evidence for it, but the Sahih Hadith that tell you that he was a rapist and tortured people for money, that's like, no, no, that's weak. That's false. Uh, so there was some chat a little bit a while ago about the grading of Hadith and the summary from the chat is that Muslims just use this as a tool to deny anything they don't want to talk about. And that's very true. Yeah, it is true. Yeah, I mean, how is this the only religion in the world where you lie and deny your own sources to defend it? And ultimately in doing that, you leave yourself with no ground left to stand upon as Thaddeus mentioned earlier takes away everything from under them yeah I mean, as long as they win right as long as they, they just want to win however they i don't get it don't they believe their own sources and it and are these are these stories true or are these scholars lying because if they're lying they're going to hell why are they believing a bunch of lying scholars otherwise if these stories are true why aren't they proud and, and want to talk about them about well yeah i i think that it goes to the you know the True, true origin of their confidence in their religion. As long as we're attacking the Quran and the Hadith, they can say, well, you know, even if I don't have an answer to that, I know that the scholars have an answer. So it's all good. But when we get to attacking Muhammad's uh, personality, you know, the things he did, uh, attacking the scholars, showing how they're lying, then, then it gets really awkward for them because they can't just dismiss it anymore. They can't just say, well, you know, I don't have an answer, but I know my a mom does, and that's good enough for me. Uh, and, and as long as we're just, it, Lloyd says this a lot, but as long as we're just talking about the Quran, you can just go in circles because ultimately the Quran is very ambiguous. It's very vague. And uh, it, as long as we're debating the Quran, and not the authoritative interpretation of the Quran, they can say, well, it doesn't mean that, blah, blah, blah. But then when we go to the authoritative interpretations and we bring those to them, then they then it gets awkward because they can't deny it anymore. They can't say, well, they can try. I mean, they can say that guy's a liar, but they, they, they clearly don't understand the implications of that. They, so uh, I, I think that Attacking the Quran is good. I, I think attacking the Hadith is good, but I think we need to do more than that. I think we need to, you know, take the fight to where Muslims' actual confidence is. If, if they're not Christians, they don't believe in the Bible only, or in their case, the Quran only. They believe in a lot of things, mm -hmm. and as long as you're only attacking the Quran, you're only attacking, you know, five percent of their actual beliefs. And they're leaving the other 95% untouched. It's a good point. Yeah, we've got to use that to our advantage because all it makes is for more, uh, it sounds bad, but like, you know, more, uh, more, more targets, more targets, more things to look the to. Military term is more, <laughs> the military term is attack surface. Attack surface, okay. <laughs> yeah, because remember, they've got us focusing on this tiny microscopic little target called the Quran when Islam is well beyond that. It's like you're focusing on a doormat and you've got a whole city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well said. Uh, and Kaiser had a, a very good comment here. He said that in Indonesia and Malaysia, they've only translated the hadith that have 
good things in them. And, you know, we even see that to a lesser extent, but we see it in English too, that the, the most embarrassing material is rarely translated. The only, you, you certainly, they don't translate the whole work. You might be able to find parts of it translated in a, a scholarly paper or something that's talking about it in English, but the work itself hasn't been translated. And there's reason for that. They, they, yeah. they are embarrassed by this material and they, they know that it would be damaging to the average Muslim if they heard it. Uh, you you make a lot of you just spoken a lot of truth there, Thaddeus. Um, yeah, crazy. Yeah. So um, Jeffrey says, um, what if Christians were denying Paul's letters and calling them weak? How would yeah. that come down as a defense? If we did that, they would jump all over us. I'm sure. Yeah, they would. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, yeah. You, you've. Yeah, we look, we have a lot more attack surface. There's so much more. And they're not prepared to deal with these questions about Muhammad's divinity. I, I hopefully in this discussion so far, and I I've been trying to touch on different aspects of Muhammad, but hopefully I've I've made plain in terms of my argument that Muhammad actually is divine in Islam. He is the partner of Allah. He is essential. Allah cannot function without him. And that Muhammad is Jesus. Yeah, you portrayed fact, that very clearly both from the attributes as well as from, I mean, the indirect and, I mean, as close to direct as you can get of the references with things like the star of Bethlehem and, um, you know, the stones and the tree of life and all of these things. So, I mean, yeah, you set out, you, you, you laid it out in the beginning saying Allah is no partner. Allah is, is uh, you know, he's eternal and all these things. And yet we see Muhammad elevated to that, to that level, just about as close to that level as you can get. Wasn't so. the Quran the first thing created? Yeah. But apparently it was Muhammad. I mean, does that theology make sense? W yeah. Where do you find something you can agree on? With, where it's like, well, yeah, that's what it is. So, yeah, that's that's my story. And thank you for the time and the attention. Yeah. So, you know, we, we have a great audience right now. I, I hate to yeah. wrap it up, but uh, we have other places we need to be. So we're going to be wrapping it up here. I'll give uh, each of my guests a chance to share their the closing thoughts kind of summarize or wrap up what we've been talking about. Uh, Io, why don't you go first? Yeah, uh, just, you know, like I said, this was my second time on with both you and Lloyd, and I think you did an excellent job at uh, both of you, you know, just really exposing this idea of Muhammad being elevated to a level that we just don't see um, touted among mainstream Muslim scholars, mainstream Muslim apologists on YouTube, and then even just your average Muslims in the comments. Um, but nevertheless, I think that it's very important to, to discuss because um, it really is a can of worms that can start to expose the reality of who Muhammad is, both in Islam as well as well as in just generality, because, you know, we can't be simply buying the mainstream narrative that we're receiving from these Muslims. And I think that when we start to examine these things and blow the lid open, uh, the conversation can open up. And even though I know they won't like it, ultimately, hopefully it can lead to more uh, leaving it and you know praying that they would come to Jesus and so you know, thank you Lloyd for vacations for Christianity yeah. if Allah is Jesus mm -hmm. and they have to make this happen um, on something Thaddeus said I've noticed that various awkward hadith have started to disappear from the online databases I used to be able to find some things and I mentioned this to you Thaddeus in the past but recently for this I was doing a lot of research so it's new information to me as well in some ways right so I'm not as familiar with it as some of the other stuff I know but certain hadiths i can't trace anymore they, they're missing um you know so i've got to find pdfs but the and then mojo dude said wasn't the pen created first well the thing is the scholars all differ right but the general consensus of the scholars becomes the main so if seven out of ten say well muhammad's little finger was the first thing created then that's the consensus so generally speaking that's it you know and also who's the most authoritative of the scholars if the most authoritative of the scholars agree then, then that's what it becomes all right, and uh, I'll just close with Diane, who said that this is definitely identity theft of the savior of the world. We put Allah on notice 600 years before your counterfeit was born. Jesus had already predicted the coming of false prophets, and that is exactly what we see in Muhammad. Uh, thank you for joining us, everyone. We'll continue this discussion of how Jesus, or I mean, how Muhammad is the counterfeit Jesus at a later date. Uh, don't know the exact day yet. Look for an announcement about that. Uh, possibly late next week or possibly 
the week after. I will have a new scripted video out, I believe, tomorrow. Uh, it's been complete. I've released it on Patreon. So it's just a matter of uh, releasing that to the public, which I'll probably do tomorrow. Be looking at the Quran verse that states that from every living thing uh, or every living thing was made from water. This is claimed as a scientific miracle of the Quran. Supposedly, this was unknowable knowledge in the seventh century. So I take the claim seriously and analyze whether anyone, any intelligent person could figure this out, whether people before Muhammad had known about it, and then look at what the tafsir say to see if that's even what the verse means to begin with. Mm. Well, even so, those were over the place. <laughs> so, so take a look, uh, be on the lookout out for that coming tomorrow and be on the lookout for other upcoming announcements. Uh, we'll be having a show on Sharia law on Sneakers Corner soon, I believe. He just emailed me today. So no, uh, no idea on the date yet. We'll work that out. But keep an eye out for those announcements. Thank you for watching and God bless. Yeah.